Welcome back to The Living Island. I want to talk today about succession. Um, it's defined as a predictable sequential change over time in the relative abundance of dominant species. Basically, it's whoever is the biggest who comes next. That's what it comes down to. Trouble is, a forest stand composition with all of these different trees and understory plants, you can't perfectly predict what will happen because succession as we understand it is mainly initiated and driven by disturbance. Now, disturbance. Given the gravity of disturbance, that is fire, wind, flood, earthquake, I mean, depending on where you are, volcano. Let's just say we have a fire. Everything's burned out. Early successional species, like birch and aspen, I'll look at trees, they tend to be smaller at maturity Birch trees and aspens don't grow very big. Don't grow very big even that way, but tall as well. They're intolerant to low light conditions, so they like to come in when there's nothing else there. A lot of sunshine, a lot of rain, a lot of soil. Late successional species tend to be larger at maturity. They take longer to grow and they're tolerant more to shaded conditions. Not dense darkness, but shade. These are your pines and spruces and most of the conifers. Shade tolerance is particularly important in determining the order of succession from basically a burned out area to a mature forest. Because the shade tolerance of a sapling, keep in mind, a seed opens up and by the end of the summer, maybe you got something like that, you know, a couple centimeters. It's going to interact with the light. If there's a lot of light and they love light, they'll grow. If not, they won't survive. It's as simple as that. So species level diversity in shade tolerance, in a sense, who can deal with the shade as things grow up, is the primary driver of succession in the northern forest ecosystems that we're part of. As the light environment of the understory changes, so let's deal with the island, There's no fire, but trees fall down, canopies open up, light comes down. That's good. These seedlings of different species will survive and thrive preferentially. In a sense, they prefer this. Can they get that? And these lead to the shifts in species composition. It's not survival of the fittest in that sense. It's survival of who can take advantage of the situation at hand, knowing that that situation always changes. It stabilizes, but it never just holds on forever. That, that's not good. We have some indication of this already on the island. 4,000 years ago when the Mi'kmaq people came here, the dominant tree must have been the white pine. They named the island Quimenicook, the island of pines. Now today, long time later, the white pine is still dominant as it lords over the entire island in height. But the balsam fir 
and the white spruce may actually have more trees on the island than the white pine. Who's dominant? Likewise, we're seeing more intrusion from the red maple. And that could indicate a change that is possibly linked to the climate. However, <laughs> there may be an inherent trade-off here between shade tolerance and growth rate in full sunlight. Some trees maximize their growth rates in open conditions, as I said. Others have lower growth rates in full sunlight. They take their time. It allows them to continue growing as the conditions become more shaded. That gives those first trees more of a problem. So ch shade tolerance species generally have a higher survival rate in low light, but low growth rates. So if you come on fast right at the beginning, you better keep going because of the, kind of like the tortoise and the hare, you know? The hare said, I'm here, I can rest. The tortoise kept coming and passed him. That's what happens here. Remember, the canopy is created by pines and then the secondary is the spruce and the fir. And if you've ever been into a boreal forest, it can be dark. Um, there's, I, I've gone through places where there's nothing growing on the ground because it is dark. There's just debris down there becoming soil. And that makes it rather hard for a maple seedling to make any headway. It needs light. So the relative shade tolerance of seedlings provides us with a clue of the competition of future forests because only those seedlings who are best adapted to that current light environment as it changes will survive to maturity. Now the red maple is one of the most abundant tree species in the Northeast. Um, we're talking New England and the Maritimes, and you, you'll see it along the St. Lawrence Rivers as well. It is generally considered to be a mid-succession. So after that birch and aspen take root, sometime later the red maple will move in. It's an interesting adaptation of the red maple that as a seedling, and, and, I've, and I've watched this, I mean, I watch it, I've seen different times, as a little seedling, say about a couple centimeters or inches, it will move its leaves to adapt to the sunlight. Now, sun's going to move across the sky, that'll change. Maybe a tree over here will block some sun. Depending on what happens, and I, 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 I'll go with like this. Here's the, here's the stalk down here. If there's a need for light, it'll hold its two leaves like this and get all the light it can. And especially in shade, it, it'll really hold that. But it doesn't need all that light all the time. And as the sun is like, it'll drop its leaves like this and kind of relax. It's sort of like a coffee break. You know, it, it works. The current theory suggests that a forest understory dominated by red maple would imply, because that's what we're seeing, that it will eventually dominate the ecosystem. However, there's always a fly in the ointment. According to a Northeast Forest Ecology study that I read, a white-tailed deer, one deer, browsing in a forest, like what we have around here, and you gotta listen to this, it will consume three kilograms, or seven pounds, of fresh weight vegetation per day. Now, think, think, think of yourself. Are you eating three kilograms of food or seven pounds of food per day? That amounts to 200 kilograms 
or 600 pounds of sapling buds. 600 pounds of these little buds that you see at the end of the twigs, they just keep munching away at them. Which in turn is over 4,000 saplings per day. During the average winter season, which is say November to, depending on where you live, around here it could be June, but say from November to at least March, over 880 saplings will be affected by the browsing of one white-tailed deer per year. And the favorite browsing being the red and sugar maples. I can somehow hear the white pines looking down and snickering. The future will be interesting. See you next time. Take care.